Are you relying on one stream of income to support your family? You ever thought about what would happen if that income just went away? What would you do? How would you function financially? Well, this is something that we absolutely never think about unless we experience it ourselves. Unfortunately, it happened to me about 10 years ago. And my goal for you today, after you watch this video, I want you to completely leave with a new perspective on not just money, but how you make your money. How are you bringing that into the household? If you're new here, I'm Dr. Jeff Anzalone, a dentist in Louisiana, and probably like you, I started off my career following the quote, traditional path, working long hours and focusing on building my practice, building my business. When we get out of school, we get out of training, that's what we're focused on, right? But after I had this life-changing incident, which I'm gonna to talk to you in a little bit, I realized, you know what? Jeff, there's gotta be a better way. There has to be a better way to function to where I can still enjoy my time with my kids and wife and do things, but also enjoy my business and practice as well. Kind of, kind of bring all that together. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me take you back to when about two weeks after my training, I was supposed to come back here in my hometown of Louisiana to practice with the group. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get into all those details. The whole job offer fell through. And if you've gone to medical school or dental school or law school, or whatever, you'll realize they don't teach you anything about two important parts, money and how to run a business or practice. So I knew how to treat patients, but I didn't know anything about a practice or running, running a business or anything. So I was relying on that group to teach me. Now, when that all fell through, I mean, literally I had already booked the U haul to come back here and work. I mean, it's, it was just crazy. I'm just, was so focused on it. We'd already bought a home interest only. We had a two month old owed $300,000 in student loan debt. And if you can imagine in that situation, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. And I look back at all the th bad things that have happened in my life and they've happened for a reason. I think God puts things in our past to challenge us, to put us to adversity because he knows that something else is coming down the line. And, you know, kind of like I used to play guitar and, and after I played for a while, I started getting these calluses on my fingers. It hurt for a while but then I get calluses and get tough so I could play more guitar. So I think we go through these different things and it, and it gives these calluses on us. So we're ready whenever we go through the next trial or, or tribulation or adversity event or whatever. Long story short, luckily a, another dental specialist reached out, he heard about things and he allowed me to rent space from him to, to start to network with the dentist in the area. He allowed me, he started to teach me how to run a practice. And during this two year period, and he knew that I eventually want to go buy my own building, which I'm, I'm still in today and start my own practice. But he was teaching me everything non-clinical. And, and, I, and I love these yellow notepads. And, and literally every day I was, you know, writing stuff down, you know, how to hire somebody, how to do payroll, how to buy, buy supplies, you know, whatever non-clinical issue to, to run a business, to run a practice. And I looked up after about two years and I'd written so many notes, I actually thought, well, you know what, there's probably somebody else out there that can benefit from this and put it all together. I self-published it and it's still selling today on Amazon, my, my first book called Simply What They Don't Teach You in Dental School. It's very basic. It, you know, if you are a practice owner and you read it, it you know it's really basic, but when you go back and think, well, you know what? They didn't teach me any of this in dental school. So I wanted to put that together. But um, anyway, back then I was a big Dave Ramsey follower and I'm glad I was because when we got out, it was just like chaos. It was all over the place. And that setback really put me into survival mode. And I was raised in a household, probably like you or other people, we had like a scarcity mindset. I always thought money was scarce. I'd always heard things like we can't afford that, that costs too much. We think money grows on trees. And to me, I was thinking, okay, when I get money, because it's limited, I need to hold on to it. And when I had this setback, it, it really put me back into to, to this scarcity survival mode. And back then I was listening to Dave Ramsey and he is really for 90 plus percent of the Americans because, you know, 90% of the Americans are more broke. So that is his target audience. And it's for people that go there. Most of them are employees and they work their entire life. So he's teaching financial principles. He teaches with the baby steps. Okay. And because I was all over the place, I'm glad I had some structure because based on my personality, I need structure in my life to follow. I like to follow a plan and I, and I follow the baby steps. And the first one was emergency funds. So we got the emergency fund. And then most people stay in baby step two, the longest, which is the debt snowball. That is list out all your debts. You, you would list them out. I actually had a whiteboard like this and I listed them all out, smallest to largest. Throw everything that you can at the smallest one and then pay minimum on, on all your other debts. So psychologically, 
when you knock out that first debt, it, it snowballs, hence the name debt snowball, and it keeps you going and you just work down the list. I started to do that. It took us about seven and a half years. We paid off the 300K student loans. We paid off that first house because part of his baby steps is to pay off your mortgage. So we paid off that first house. We had a college fund going for the kids, 529 plans, practice retirement account. I was funding it along the way. That was one of the differences that I had was he doesn't recommend, he recommends all pausing on investments to get out of debt. And I thought with me having a high enough income, once the practice started going with me being disciplined enough, I could do both. I could pay extra. I didn't, I didn't want to lose all those years of compound interest because remember, I was thinking that you had to operate financially like he was teaching, which there's nothing wrong with it because again, it's for most of the, most people in America, you're going to work for 30 or 40 years. And, and I'm, I'm also looking at all the dentists in my hometown who many of them work until they're 70 or 80. And, and you know, they were, were constantly hunched over the chair. We're kind of in this position and, you know, our, our neck hurts, our back hurts, arm hurts, hand, carpal tunnel, wrist, all of that. But I just saw that's just part of it. You know, that that's just what you do. You work your entire life and you retire on a 401k and you hope and pray that the stock market is up, which I didn't really think about it back then because I, I was just young and dumb and just was ready to get out of debt and get going. So I'm on this path and I'm cruising along. And after I paid off everything and after I had maxed out the practice account, all extra money was going into Vanguard index funds. And that's how I operated the first 10 to 11 years of my practice. And again, remember, this is all I've been taught. You know, I, I'd met with a couple, a couple of financial advisors early on, never did go with them I, because I was strictly could do it myself on Vanguard. Why pay somebody one or 2% a year when I can just do it myself online. And they were also teaching this principle. You know, you have to be consistent with it. I do agree with them. Be consistent with, with whatever you do to be consistent and work 30, 40 years and life goes on. All right. So the, the first issue was the practice, the job falling through. The second issue happened after I've been practicing 10, 11 years. My kids were eight and six. We were snow skiing. We go to Beaver Creek a lot and got off the lift, started going down and I had a kid cut in front of me. And I, when I swerved, I fell. You know, when you fall, you you put your hands down. Well, it bent my wrist back. And, and I played sports my whole life and really the only thing that I'd really gotten up until that point was a, a, a really, really, maybe a fractured ankle, but a really bad sprained ankle. This was like, I was a fullback in seventh or eighth grade. And my dad was, was on the sidelines and he, he actually could hear it pop. That's how loud it was. And I was on crutches for like eight or 10 weeks. But up until that, you know, when you never heard or anything, you don't even think about it. So when this incident happened and I got hurt and it really scared me because you just, you know, you're operating, you're operating financially. You're just, you're going through the motions. And then it's like, whoa, what if I can't practice for a month or two or four months? What if I need surgery? That sort of thing. So all these thoughts started going in my mind, but yet the only thing that I knew what to do was what everybody is doing. They're, they're operating on this. They're operating on one, one income stream for the most part. This to me was my wake up call. And, and, and I could see just how reckless financially this was. Now, if I'm single and I can move around and do stuff, it wasn't be that big of a deal, but being married with two kids, this woke me up. So I said, okay, I got to do something about it. I have to take matters in my own hand and did a deep dive on podcasts, YouTube videos, books, mentors, coaches, friends around here. I've got a bunch of friends that they manage their parents' portfolio, real estate, and real wealthy. And if I could condense months and months of, of this education into two things, this is what, this is what I came up with. And actually when I came up with the, when I found out these two things, this really helped narrow my focus and guide me to what I needed to be doing. Number one, the majority of people, the majority of really, really wealthy people, they invest in real estate. At that time, I only had my house. Nobody was paying me rent. So that didn't even count. All right. And number two, these wealthy people had anywhere from seven to nine income streams at that time Jeff had one and something that I else that I found out this was this was later on in life when I started to network getting masterminds getting groups if I'm in first class I'm, I'm engaging the people next to me because I, I like to talk to them and and, it, and it's funny because when you when you talk I'm talking about people that are worth 10 million 20 million 100 million I mean, talking about really wealthy dudes okay when you ask them hey you know what do you do for a living 
they don't say, they don't say this. They don't say, I am dot, dot, dot. I am a dentist. I am a doctor. I am a, an attorney. They don't say that. Why? Because if you say that, if, if that's how you operate, then you're, you only have one income stream, right? I am a dentist. Well, a dentist typically has one income stream right? Instead, they say this, I own dot, dot, dot. I own a company. I own companies. I own businesses. I own real estate. I own. It's ownership. It's, it's a totally different. And, and I guess I really never caught that growing up because you just don't really pay attention to it. Oh yeah, that guy, he's worth tons of money. And, and you subconsciously, you would think, oh yeah, that guy owns all this land or all this property. He owns all these businesses or whatever, but it's true. Okay. So all of this narrowed down to, okay, Jeff, this is what you need to do. You need to go invest in real estate to get multiple income streams. And I needed to do this to help not go out and buy a bunch of crap liabilities, but I need to do this to mitigate the risk of me operating financially. Did I have disability insurance? Yes. Do I have disability insurance? Yes, I do. But that's not going to help me to stay on the lifestyle that I am. Plus who wants to go through their whole life relying on some sort of disability company, an insurance company, I mean, if you're a dentist or a doctor, you know how it is dealing with insurance companies. They can screw you in a heartbeat. They can say, oh yeah, did you see this, this little clause in our thing? And you know, it's, I don't want to deal with that. Okay. I want to take matters in my own hands. And if something happened to me, I have these other income streams coming in. So now I thought back then that real estate was, I had to go out and buy a house and put a tenant in it because all my friends in, in the town, they had, their dads had single family homes. Some of them had apartments or self storage, but the most of them rent house. So I'm thinking, okay, that's what I need to do. And I almost pulled the trigger on a house here. I got a friend of mine to meet me at lunch. I didn't know what I was looking at. I'm just walking around going, Hey, you think this is a good deal? And I had no clue, but then there was a dentist in Dallas and he was a retired dentist teaching other dentists about real estate. And I said, you know what, before I do this, let me go check that out. Luckily I went there and, and he has this really expensive group to get in and you have access to all these quote trusted advisors. And, and I didn't want to pay all that money. I think it's like 120 grand a year just to be in the group now. But what it did do, it opened my eyes to all the different ways that I could stay focused on my main wealth building tool, which is your main wealth building tool. That is your income. You spend all the time, money, and effort to get your, for your dentist, to get your dental degree, your, your medical degree, to get your, whatever it is, to get your education, taking your time away from that and, and trying to go out and find property or manage the tenants. Or when they, when they knock a hole in the wall and they leave, or they bust a pipe in the middle of the night, that's taking time away from your main wealth building tool. Okay. So what I learned from being at that event was there's way multiple different ways to make money in real estate passively. So I could stay focused on my dental practice. And the number one thing that I got out of it, and I'd never heard about this before was something called a real estate syndication. And this is, this is basically a group investment and the group investment has two, two different types of people. They have general partners and they have limited partners. And the easiest way to explain this is being on a flight. Flight has two different types of people. They have the passengers who are the limited partners. And these are, these are people that get the seats on the plane. Limited partners are passive investors. And for a passenger on a plane, you, you pay your money, you buy your ticket, you sit on the plane. You don't really do much, right? You just go from point A to point B. Limited partners, they buy their ticket to get on the plane. They use their capital to get on the plane to go on the trip. That's pretty much it. And the limited partners, they're putting their money in. The general partners are like the pilots on the plane. They handle everything. You know, they're setting the flight plan. They're, they're doing the checklist. They're making Making sure all the lights and knobs and flaps and engine and everything's working. So for the general partners, they act like the pilot. So they're going out, they're locating the deals, they're finding them, they're managing them, they're dealing with tenants, they're doing all of that. But here's the thing, both, both the pilots and the passengers or the general partners and limits partners, they both, even though they have totally different roles, they both have the same thing that they're wanting to do. And that is on a plane, go from point A to point B, but in a real estate syndication, they're both investing in an LLC. And then that LLC buys the property. And then eventually after typically a, a whole period of five to seven years, that property will sell. All right. And what was really cool about this was I didn't know anything about it, but there was a ton of people doing it. All right. And, and, and a little bit later, I'm going to give you an example of if you are to put your money in one of these syndications, sort of what the returns are expected. Okay. All right. Before we move forward, I want to go back, take a step back to when we were talking about Dave Ramsey. 
Again, his principles are for the masses, get out of debt, you don't want any debt, pay off your debts, and then invest in a 401k and live happily ever after. Well, he references the book a lot by Dr. Thomas Stanley called, and you may have heard of this book, The Millionaire Next Door. This book was actually written in, I believe, 1996. And basically Dr. Thomas Stanley and one other guy, they went and they interviewed thousands and thousands of everyday millionaires, people that some of them didn't even have college degrees. They just, they worked their whole life. You know, there's good old hardworking people, blue collar people, just regular people, people on the street. But these people were millionaires and they wanted to get the, what are their traits? What are they doing? And most of them were consistent. They consistently, they consistently invested in a 401k. Most of them were very frugal. They bought secondhand cars, they bought used cars. A lot of them bought used clothes, went to the thrift store, just very frugal, very thrifty. They lived below their means. They didn't spend all of their money and then some like like most people. So th this was, was the characteristics. And here's the thing, and again, this was back in 96, but the majority of them made less than a hundred thousand dollars a year and they still retired a millionaire. So he, he referenced this book a lot. And, and I read the book a couple of times and I was, and again, it was just, it kind of, everything went together. That's how I need to operate. That That's really the only way to operate. And then once my skiing accident happened and I started doing all this research, I started reading a lot of books and one of the, if not the top financial book, it's kind of crazy because it was written in 1937 and to this day, it's still one of the top books. It, it was written by Napoleon Hill and it's called Think and Grow Rich. Now he's written several other books. Now it's not called How to Get Rich Quick. It's not called How to Get Rich. It's not called how to get rich quick, anything like that. Most people skip over this. It's think and grow rich. God gave us a brain for a reason. And when you read that book, you will realize. So very similar, this book to this one, he went out and he interviewed at that time, or again, this is before the Great Depression, he interviewed people that are millionaires. To this day, these people will be multi-billionaires. The, the, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, I mean, the people that were very, very wealthy. And the same thing, he went out and he wanted to get the traits, the characteristics of what were these people doing? Why were they so successful? Just like Stanley did in The Millionaire Next Door. And I still read this book. I try to read this book at least still once a year, okay? Because I, I always find something new. And, and actually the last time I, I read it, I realized I, I kind of missed something. And, and it's something called the success pyramid. So there's, and, and when I looked at recently, when I was reflecting back on my life and now I'm relying on more income streams from real estate and businesses than my dental income. And I'm looking all the way back at, what I've done, this book really resonates with me. Okay. Because he found number one, these people, these millionaires and billionaires, they started off with a desire and not just any desire, a white hot desire. All right. I was in dental school. If, if you're a dentist, you've been in dental school, you can appreciate this. So we used to have to make our, our gold crowns and they would give us little squares of 24 karat gold. And part of that, we'd have to heat it up in a crucible. And when you would heat it up, it would go through different temperature phases, stages, and would change colors. One of the hottest colors is when it turned bright white, all right? And that's, that's what made me think about this, not just a desire, but a white hot desire to, to do whatever they were doing to be successful. But think about this. How many people that you know that have tried to lose weight and start off like maybe on a diet, maybe they started in January after they ate too much and at Christmas, so they, they get a gym membership and they last what till end of February and that's it, and they quit. Well, when you, when you look at the people that quit versus the people that you hadn't seen in years, you're like, oh my gosh, how much weight have you lost? These people have lost like a hundred pounds, 150 pounds. And the characteristic is those people had a white hot desire. They had a why. When I was looking back at what I'd done and what I've accomplished, I had that white hot desire, the wrist injury. Because no matter what it took, and I have failures, I've lost money, I've bought and scammed by people, I've messed up, but that wasn't going to stop me from doing everything that I can to get out of the financial situation that I was in, relying on that one income stream. So that's number one, white hot. And this, again, this is success pyramid. So you have this white hot desire, which leads to, you have to have faith or belief that you can do it. Okay. You have to have faith or belief that you can do it. Imagine being on a football team and you've practiced all summer, you're getting ready to play that first game and your coach comes in and says, Hey guys, you know, we've been working hard all summer, but you know who we're playing? 
were playing a state championship last year and they haven't even really lost any players from last year. I know we've worked hard, but more than likely we're not going to win, but let's just do our best in, in going out there and fight. Think about that. Think about what the mindset of the players would be like if your coach doesn't have belief in you. It, same thing if, if you don't have belief that you can lose the weight, if you don't have belief that you can become financially independent, if you don't have belief that you can get into medical school or dental school or do whatever. So just, just look back in your life and look about, look at the things that you've accomplished and, and think about it in a perspective was, did you ever doubt yourself? Probably you didn't. And that's probably why you have acquired what you've acquired because you had this faith and belief. So you have the white hot desire. I, I wanted to do something about my financial situation. Okay. I had faith. I had belief because all these other people I'm reading about these other people, I'm living in the same town as these other people that all around me are investing in real estate. Many of them don't even have a college degree. And here I was with all of these years after, you know, four years of dental school and four years of residency. I knew I could do it. Okay. So I, I had belief in myself. And then the third part is, and this is one of the most important parts. The A is the action. You have to do something. Ski accident, gave me the desire. I believed I could do it. What I do, it took action. I started to read. I started to network. I started to watch podcasts, listen to podcasts, YouTube videos, taking some sort of action. Finally invested in that first deal, which helped to feed into the desire again, to do more of it. And again, these three things just feed on themselves. This is, this is the success pyramid. Napoleon Hill, I don't know how many hundreds of people that he interviewed, but this was the trait that all of them had in it. It wasn't like they were super educated or or super talented or, or born with a silver spoon in their mouth. This was how they operated. This is how they thought. Hence the name think and grow rich. Now, initially when we started, I told you that I wanted you to have two main takeaways from this video, not only about money. And we've talked a good bit about that, but also how you're making money. And one of the books that, and if you go back and you, and this is what I found the majority of the successful people, and if they're successful people in your area, ask them this. I'd be curious to see what they say. What was the one book that really changed your trajectory? And it was the Purple Bible, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, I'm not saying that you have to agree with everything he says, which I don't agree with everything anybody says, okay? But you can take bits and pieces. And he was all about finding ways to use good debt, leverage that for real estate, for businesses, for passive income, a lot of the things that I was talking about. But one of the things that really opened my eyes was how I was making money. Let me ask you a question. How are you making money? All right. So let's, let's talk about this and it's something that he calls the cash flow quadrant. And most of us, we, we have been, or we are on the left side, which he actually, he call, he calls the, the poor side of the quadrant. Most of us start off as an E or an employee. And most people are employees because they like the job security. They like the paycheck. They like the salary. They like, Hey, if I go in and clock so many hours, I'm going to get X amount of dollars. So they, they like the benefits, maybe health, maybe life, maybe a, a 401k that that's security. And you don't have a lot of responsibility. Again, I started off when I was working for that dental specialist. I was an employee for two years. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong if you're an employee now. I'm just, I'm just showing you, I want you to think about, how you're making money. The whole point is I want you to think about how you're operating financially, and then you can go in and make the decision. So you have options, not just one work until you're 70 or 80 years old and hope and pray the stock market's up when you start taking money out of your 401k. You know, that's what, that's how most of us operate. I'm, I'm trying to give you options. Okay. Now employees. So that, those are the, the pros of employees. The con of, of the employees, is this, you are trading your time for money. As you know, you can always make more money, work longer hours, work on the weekends, take more shifts. Look what the government does when they run out of money. They just print more of it, right? And once you get a, your head around the mindset that money is not scarce, money is not limited, money is unlimited. There's an abundant supply of money. And once I understand this, then you're not so focused on just Anything that comes in, you oh, I got to save. I got to put it under my mattress. I have to stick it in a checking account just so I can just watch it grow as I'm putting money in it. And my money's not making money for me. I, I'm, remember, I am a doctor or dentist or whatever. I am the one making the money, making the money grow in the account. So after two years, I thought, hey, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do, start my own practice and be self-employed. Nobody was going to tell me what to do. I can hire, I can fire. I wasn't working for anybody anymore. I can make the decisions if I want to be off, whatever. I thought this was, this was the American dream. Just like they tell you the American dream is to have a house 
and that's your best asset, which, you know, I think about assets and liabilities, it's not. Why? Because it doesn't put money in your pocket. That's another subject for another video. Self-employed, it really, when you think about it, it's probably worse than being employed because everything's on you and you're having to pay. And another thing I didn't talk about with employees and with self-employed people, we're over here paying the highest amount of taxes. Why? Because we're have one income stream called active income. Your active income is what you pay your income taxes on. Now with being an employee, you know, you're paying your FICA, your Medicare, your social security, but with, with self-employed now you have to also pay. So it being seven and a half percent or whatever. Now you're having to pay for your employees It's double 15%. Now I do understand that you get, you do get some deductions and that sort of thing. But again, the bottom line is this, employees and self-employed people, if, if you fall into one of these categories, which you probably do, you're trading time for money and you are in, you are paying the highest amount of taxes. That's the poor side. The goal that I want, I wanted to get to after reading this book, and I want you to get to as well is, is to come over to the rich side, not the poor side, the rich side. And we start off with B, the business owner. Best analogy I can give you is a friend of mine growing up. He took over a health club here in my hometown and he, I think he failed out of LSU. So he, and I think he did, he did get his, his degree. But the point is, even though he didn't have the best education or the longest education, or he wasn't as educated as me, this joker was over here in, in the business column and I was here. Let me ask you a question. How, how long can you take off? If, if you own your own business practice, how long can you take off? How long have you ever taken off for vacation? Well, up until just a few years ago, the longest I'd ever taken off was like five days, maybe a week. Not that I couldn't afford to be on the vacation, but I couldn't afford not to be on it because the pri I'm still paying employees. I'm still paying the overhead supplies. You know, all of those things, they build up. No money is coming in except unless I'm trading my time for money, I'm trading my time for money. And that's the only way. So if I'm down for a week or two, it, it hurts. Okay. But because he owned a health club, he could take off for a month, two months, as long as he wanted to. Why? Because he was a business owner. He had people, managers working under him. He didn't have to be there for me to go check in and work out. Brilliant. It's awesome. That's how he was making money. And last but not least, the ultimate goal that I am working towards, and again, I want you to work towards is this cop is this quadrant. Ah, you're the investor and the investor is this, your money is making money for you, not you making the money. Your money is making money for you. In Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary, AKA Mr. Wonderful. He's always talking about this. He's always talking about getting your money. I think he calls them his soldiers. So every day he has an army of soldiers, which are his dollars. And he's sending those soldiers out to go and bring back more soldiers. They're doing the work, not you. Okay. We talked about this before. So you're focused on your biggest wealth building tool, your active income. And then you take that money then you invest it into things that make you more money. We talked about real estate syndications earlier, which I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through what kind of a, a typical one looks like. But again, it, you're being consistent. Is this get rich quick? No, just like the millionaire next door, they were consistent, consistently putting in their 401k compound interest. It grew 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And finally they retired a millionaire. Now, luckily I've had a high enough income. And if you're a doctor, a dentist, attorney, uh, somebody like that, you can do this too, but you have to be consistent with it. I had been investing in a stock market into a retirement account. So I had that, but once I started learning about real estate, now it's more focused on the real estate syndication. So I, I've had both during the years. Now it's more focused on the real estate. All right. So now I have all these multiple streams of income coming in again to mitigate the risk. So if you are on the left side, you're in something called the rat race. You're, you're trading your time for money. And unfortunately, most people that are in the rat race, they don't even know they're in the rat race. I'll do some financial coaching for people and ask them where they are financially so we can work on a goal to get out. And they can't even tell me what their expenses are, what their taxes are. So if, if you don't know where you are at point A, how are you going to know where you want to go to point B? And the other thing is they can't even tell me what they want because they're so ingrained in the rat race. It, it's, they've been so, their mind it been so brainwashed that they have to work for 30 or 40 years. So what do they do, they get up every morning, they eat breakfast, they commute, they work from nine to five or eight to five or whatever, four or five days a week. And they just keep doing it. 
on and on. And they don't even think about the consequences or anything. They're just, they're, they're just on autopilot. And this is how I was. And, and, and I would, to this day, I would probably still be operating like this had I not had a wake up call with my wrist. And hopefully what I'm telling to you, if you've never been hurt or injured or sick, which hopefully you haven't, with this information that I'm giving you right now, hopefully this is going to be your wake up call to get you to start thinking about number one, how money works. And number two, how you're making money. And are you in this rat race? Do you, do you have a plan to get out of your current situation? If not, start today. Step number one, self-evaluation, self-assessment. Evaluate your current financial situation. Well, how do I do that, Jeff? Well, just like when we look at real estate, we're looking at a P&L, profit loss. Take a look. Here, let's, let's draw this out for you. All right, this is where we're going to start. Very simple. Here's you. You have your J-O-B, whatever you're doing, okay? You list out your income. More than likely, you work make an income. This is how most people operate. Their income, they go down and they're buying liabilities. They're buying cars, boats, SUVs, side-by-sides. We'll put ATVs, house. Yeah, house is a liability, even though what you've been led to believe. What do all these things have? They all kick off what? They all kick off expenses, right? Your car has expenses, gas, insurance, taxes, maintenance, your house, upkeep, boats, insurance, all this stuff. Then the money goes out. You notice something? You are the one in charge of paying for all this stuff. Well, what happens if this happens to you? That goes away. Who's going to pay for all this? This, this is the typical rat race. This is the typical way. Remember we talked about the cash flow quadrant. It's how most people operate. Instead of when, instead of you keep working your job, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. We'll, we'll put like this. So, so this is number one, the typical way. And then we'll put this as number two. You, you're still going to make your income. But now, instead of focusing on all these liabilities, you take that money. Now, of course, you'll still, you know, right now, while you're getting out of this, you'll still have liabilities, but this is how I want you to ultimately operate. Take your income, invest it in things that go up in value, that put money in your pocket, not things that take money out of your pocket. This puts money in your pocket. This takes money out of your pocket, all right? The assets, the, the, the real estate, the, the businesses, you, you can have dividend paying stocks, whatever, anything that's, that's giving you return right now, not when you're 60 or 70. Now, passive income now, guess what? It is giving you income. It's giving you passive income. And guess what you can do with that passive income? You can pay for the liabilities and the liabilities, again, expenses. And then, so now your assets are paying for your liabilities. It's a simple game of math. If you can if you can add and subtract, you can do this. You're a smart person. I'm sure you are. So that that's the, your self-assessment. How are you making money and your, your current situation? And at least if you have a bunch of debts, list them out. If, if you're just all over the place, reach out to me. I certainly could help you walk you through this, coach you through this, just to get you going in the right direction. If you've never been taught this before, and then set some goals, some smart goals, you know, the specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound goals, something very specific. You know, I want a hundred thousand dollars of passive income in five years or less, something very specific, not, I want a million dollars in three years or less. And like right now you have zero. Well, that's, that's not really relevant, right? You, you want something that you, that, you know, remember you have that belief, that faith that you can achieve and start educating yourself on this money management investments. I mean, again, everything that I've learned and, and and I'm making more money. I have more non-clinical, I have more non-clinical income coming in versus clinical income. You can do this too. You can have more passive income coming in than your active income. Again, you just, you just have to be consistent with it. You have to take action. All those steps that we talked about. And so I, and I talked to you, we were talking about real estate syndications and, and I'll leave you with this because it, it is by far my favorite investment. I graduated with about 60 dentists in my class. I would let maybe three or four of them work on me. My point being is there's a lot of people out there pitching real estate syndications, pitching deals, pitching stuff to us. If you're a high income earner, if you're a doctor, a dentist, attorney, you're going to have a target on your chest because they know how stupid we are with money. That's the fact of it matter. Have I been scammed or screwed before? Yes. Will that happen to me again? Maybe, but now I've, I've learned, I've got those calluses. I've learned from my mistakes. So now I've surrounded myself with people that when people send me stuff, I've got people that are way smarter than me. They can look at it. All right. So let me walk you through an example 
of a real estate syndication and what this could potentially do to your financial future. Okay, here's a, here's a typical structure of not only the real estate syndication that I've been a limited partner in, but now that I'm a general partner in the Blue Metric Group, where we have RV parks, it's, it's all pretty much the same. So the, again, this is very basic. The numbers will work better, be easier to work with if we use a $100,000 investment. $100,000 investment, you're a limited partner in a syndication. All right, so most of them are five to seven year hold period, meaning you put your money in, they're expecting to hold it for five years. Again, this is the average before they sell it or they do a refinance and you get most of your money back. Five year hold period, 8% preferred return, which means that while your money is being held, you get, or they're projecting you to get 8%, which would be $8,000 a year, which most pay you quarterly. So if you divide this by four, so you're getting $2,000 a quarter, which most of this is tax free or tax deferred based on the depreciation. Again, I've got plenty of videos that talk about this, but when you start learning about rich people, I mean, you've probably heard the phrase that Warren Buffett's secretary is in a higher tax bracket than he is. And you think, oh yeah, whatever, that's just crap. Once you start reading about it and you learn how these people operate, again, remember they're on the right side. Most of their income is coming in from passive income, not active income. Passive income is taxed the lowest, anywhere from zero to 20%. Then when you start talking about depreciation and getting these losses from real estate, it wipes out. So you're, here's the thing. We've been led to believe you need 10, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million from your financial advisors. They want you to keep working. You know, they want to keep charging you at 1%. You know, you, you, I'll call my financial advisor friends and, oh yeah, I'm in Italy or I'm in the Bahamas or whatever. And I'm sitting here busting my butt at work. I'm like, who's this stupid person here? Me, you know, that's the best job on the planet. And, and the more assets under management they get, they just charge 1%. Of course they, of course, do they, you think they want you to retire early? Hell no. Of course they want you to keep working. That benefits them. And they're supposed to be fid fiduciary. Pfft, I hadn't found one yet. So if you want something done right, you want to take matters in your own hands. And that's what I've done. If you want to follow me and, and do what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. If not, keep doing what you're doing. Doesn't matter to me. It's, it's, it's your money. It's your life. Now you don't, my point is you don't need as much money as they tell you. Why? Because of this, if you have passive income coming in, and you can get tax-free money. Well, if you're making $400,000 a year and you're paying half in taxes, $200,000 a year, well, you got to work a lot, right? But you can focus on getting $200,000 a year and not pay any taxes. What does that do to your time? It cuts your time in half. You have to work smarter. Hence the name of the book. Remember, it was thinking real rich. So you're getting $8,000 a year, all right? Over a, over a five-year period, and we'll just we'll just do this. So after five years, let's say the, let's say the property sells eight times five. So you've gotten $40,000 in passive income and you've paid no tax on it. Then you get your original investment back hundred thousand. And, and the majority of the, of these have a equity multiple of two X or more. What that basically means is whatever investment that you put in, they're projecting you to two X your money. You put in a hundred, they're projecting you to come out with 200,000. So in this case, they're projecting you to get roughly about a, a $60,000, $60,000 profit. So when you add all this up, hence the $200,000. All right. So think about this. If you, if you did this every year, let's show you what it can happen. So this, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, not overwhelm you. This is just for illustrative purposes only. Okay. So if, if, same scenario, you're investing hundred thousand dollars. So instead of putting it in the stock market, you're going to, you're going to say, okay, I want to start doing these real estate syndications. So you're putting in, and this is, here's the years right here. So you're, again, we're being consistent with it, right? Putting in a hundred thousand a year. Well, remember we said this, this first deal, it's going to sell or refinance in five years. So after you've been doing this for five years, you've done a hundred thousand a year in different deals. Okay. You get to year six, you put your hundred thousand dollars a year, but remember your hundred thousand now on that first deal, what did it do? It doubled. So now you have an extra 200,000. So now you've got 300 K you can put towards real estate. So this is like, instead of the debt snowball, this is like the passive income snowball. And then same thing. So this, this sells and then year seven, this one sells. So same thing, you got a hundred thousand plus this. So now, you got, and then you could just, you just keep going on and on. But 
again, the point is you're, you're acquiring income each. So this, let's say it's, again, it's an 8% preferred return. So you're, you have $8,000 coming in. We'll say this is passive income. The next year you've got another eight, another eight, another eight, another eight. So at year six, you've got 50,000. So you're going to, you, you got 50,000 you got $58,000. You, you're, you're building up your passive income stream. So after year 10, you, you should be at the point where you've got six figures of passive income coming in. Now you have options. So think about this. If you would have started at like 30, I started practicing at 30 and while the time I was 40, I could have had six figures of passive income coming in, paying no taxes on it. You got options. You can retire early. Hence the name of this video, how to retire early. You can cut back. You can do something else. You can keep doing what you want. You can, instead of working five days a week, work four days a week or work every other week or take more time off, whatever. My point being is you have options when you follow something like this. This is, a, this is just one of many examples of passive income. You can go out and buy other practices. You can go out and buy other businesses. You can go start your own side hustle, whatever it is. My point being is once you start thinking differently and not just, I have to get up every morning and go to work and that's my only option and I'm miserable and I'm, and I feel sorry for myself and I have to do this for the rest of my life. No, you do not. Okay. You do not have to do this. So my, my point being is I hope now you understand about money a little bit better, how it works, how taxes work, how you're making money, how that more than likely that you're in the rat race, how important it is to shift your mindset. Okay. Shift your mindset to get out of the rat race. And if you want to learn more about my favorite real estate syndication, which are RV parks, do me a favor, check out this video.